Hello and welcome to Flix and Chill with me, Luke. And this time, or this week, I have with me Frank Kemp. So Frank, please introduce yourself. Hello. Don't know why I waved at the camera, but I did anyway. Uh, my name is Frank Kemp. I'm an avid movie watcher. At least I used to be, and then being an adult has kind of slowed that down a little bit. Um, also, in the past year and a half, I started doing stand-up comedy, so that has kind of been also one thing that's been hurting my uh, movie watching uh, cred. Um, yeah, I get it. I I I follow obviously I follow you on X or what is known used to be known as Twitter, <laughs> and you so you know. You brought up your stand-up, so let's talk about your stand-up for a brief moment. You've mentioned you have a, a red book full of not really, how would I put it, not safe for work jokes or maybe some sort of edgy yeah, jokes? I I have all these books I do to write jokes in when I think of them. And then there's a lot of times where I think of a joke and I go, oh, that, that's not really one of my kind of jokes. And then I just write them down. So now I've uh, started writing them in my red book here. Okay. And yeah, they're pretty fucked up. <laughs> care to, do you care to, or do you, are you brave um, enough to share one or two? Well, uh, tonight I'm actually doing a stand-up set where I'm doing nothing but the red book jokes. Oh, damn. Yeah, because it's at a club where these kind of jokes normally fly. Mm-hmm. So, and I don't have to worry about people recording them. Um, okay. Oh, man. Oh, like, these are jokes I wrote, and I'm just like, yeah, I'm never going to say these. And now I'm like, <laughs> it's all I've been writing this past week. Yeah. Um. Let's see. Oh, yeah. So, uh, all right. Well, you've seen a lot about the whole Epstein uh, list that people want to put out there. Yep. I'm pretty sure Michael Jackson is going to be the only person that appears on there twice as both a victim and one of the adults going. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's pretty good. Pretty good. Oh, man. Yeah, I have not workshopped any of these out loud. These have all been just the random thoughts in my head. Well, you were uh, just, you mentioned you starting out. You know, you've only been doing it, quote unquote, for a year and a half, you mentioned. Yeah. And I, I have been like, I've also been writing for like, 25 years of my life like mm -hmm. usually like, i started out writing like comedies like for like screenplays i branched out into a lot of other different genres so i've always been a joke writer but never a performer mm -hmm. and after my mother passed away one of the things that i tackled was i used a lot of my stand-up as therapy because mm -hmm. it's cheaper and i also had a giant fear of talking in public so mm -hmm. like what the hell um a few years ago i was best man at my best friend's wedding and i had to do a wedding toast mm -hmm. and again like i had not done any public speaking ever and but he's my best friend of like 30 years how am i not going to talk at his wedding and i gave a great speech a lot of laughs everyone loved it i don't remember a word of it because i blacked out while doing it like i was so scared of being in front of all these people mm -hmm. i don't have any memory of the speech and when i started doing stand-up that was the same thing i'd get on stage and next thing i know i'm off the stage mm -hmm. so i would have to record every like i still do it because i never know if i'm gonna black out from doing it or not mm -hmm. but i've gotten a lot better blackouts haven't happened in a while which is good because i don't have to go back to the video and it's been an interesting ride. Um, but yeah, now I'm starting to branch out in more not edgy comedy. Because <laughs> mm -hmm. like you said, when I started the Red Book, I had no intention of ever saying these jokes out loud. But tonight, yeah, I'm going to a venue where these are the kind of like jokes that no one else there has problems telling. So why should I? So mm -hmm. it's going to be interesting, but I'm going to I still want to try to only use the Red Book in case of an emergency. No, I understand. I understand. So I take it you're not afraid of, I guess, being cancelled? Or you're not afraid of being booed out, out of the stage? Well, the way comedy's been going, getting cancelled is a career boost at this point. <laughs> like That is true, actually. <laughs> like, what was it? Um, Tony Hedgecliffe, I think he got, you know, cancelled a while back, but now he has, like, the number one 
podcast that everyone listens to every week and it's weird i've started listening to his uh kill tony podcast Mm -hmm. and they do a lot of what i would call the red book jokes i see and but it's like even though like it's like okay you guys are going too far like that's messed up Mm -hmm. like when you listen to like the interview part of it they're like really encouraging and trying to help nurture comedians at the same time so it's like you got to take the bad with the good Mm -hmm. i can respect that but like I said, like getting canceled is just a career boost now. <laughs> so, are you hoping for that? Um, maybe I don't know what I'm planning to do with this material. Mm-hmm. Like, because uh, it would be kind of weird for me to say, "Well, I hope you get canceled tonight, Frank." But you know, I don't know if that could be taken as a, you know, because usually that would be a backhanded compliment. Yeah, and like one thing that I've been doing a lot like with like these open mics usually you just have to do like one-liner jokes so you don't really get into like the longer bits of material Mm -hmm. like i have a ton of jokes i've never been able to perform just Mm -hmm. because they're more long form Mm -hmm. like i have a whole bit about this is one that's in the red book but are you a religious man at all no i'm 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 as atheist as they come i'm i'm atheist too until you know I'm on my deathbed and I just pray to whoever to get me better. Mm-hmm. But like, you know, was Catholics, you know, if you kill yourself, they believe you go to hell, right? Yeah. All right. So does that mean as a Catholic, 9-11 was horrible, but all those people that jumped from the building, uh, they're, they're in hell now. <laughs> but, like, right. they, they're going to die on 9-11, but then they jumped and now they're just burning in hell because they didn't want to burn in a building. Yeah, that's... <laughs> That's an interesting point. See, this is why I like about comedy. Like, and I, I firmly stand on this. Comedy should cross those lines, and comedy should, or at least tiptoe, you know, tiptoe those to those lines as close as possible, because we need laughter. And also, it's a safe medium to explore what can be said, what cannot be said, or at least that's how I've always perceived it. And the benefit I have is, you know, with nine eleven being, you know over 20 years old now or 20 years ago now you can start talk, like approaching that topic was not not so much humor i'm not going i'm not like cracking jokes at 911 i'm just mm-hmm. cracking jokes at other stuff that may kind of overlap like with the whole you know suicides go to hell mm-hmm. and then 11 suicides yeah. Also, I mean, that was a weird night on YouTube by the way for me like i went on to a deep dive crafting mm-hmm. a very simple joke Mm-hmm. And uh, I got to get out of them rabbit holes sometimes. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, if there's one thing South Park has taught us, you need to wait, what, what was it, 21 point something years before you can make some, you know, some um, make fun of or something. So, yeah, 9 11. Exactly. Is- and the, they're not wrong. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, pretty- I'm, sure if I, I'm sure if I tell that joke tonight, I'm not going to hear a single word out of any 9 11 victim. No, and and again, you you wouldn't be the first because there have been comedians cracking jokes about it, you know, ever almost ever since it happened. Yeah. But so, where are you based? Or uh, just tonight? Um. Well, tonight I'll be performing in a uh, Wilmington, Delaware. Delaware. I live in Delaware, but okay. I always tell people I always tell people I'm more of like a Philadelphia-based comedian. Mm-hmm. But that was because the very first time I did stand up was at Helium Comedy Club in Philly. Okay. So I can, I, I still, like, I went to college in Philly. I only live like two hours from it. So I can say I'm a Philadelphia comedian, I think. So you would consider yourself a more of a Philadelphian rather than Delawarean? Oh, no, I'm full blown Delawarean. Just for the stand up side, I consider myself Philadelphian. That's fair. That's fair. Like, so a Delaware comedian is not too marketable. I guess. Well, see, I've never been to the United States, so I wouldn't know. I'll, I'll, you know, I'll take your word on it. <laughs> so, besides stand-up comedy and besides movies, which we'll talk about later, what would you say Frank Camp is all about? So, if you were to give me your Tinder bio, for example, you know, what would be your likes, hobbies, dislikes? Well, I used to have a Tinder profile. I, I probably still do. I just haven't logged into it. Mm-hmm. Um, but unfortunately, well, not unfortunately, but I am married. No, congrats. But thank you. Um, I do have a girlfriend also. Uh, oh, damn. Yeah, see, you, you get around. 
See, now this is the benefit with both parents dead. I can talk more about my personal life and not have to worry about being judged. <laughs> now you're just gonna but, get judged by random strangers on the internet. I mean, I do that every day. That's that's I'm I'm here for that. I mean, I use my real name on Twitter. Mm-hmm. That's fine. But no, we do kind of have like a bit of like a semi-open relationship thing. But like, yeah, Ben was the wife. I've known her since junior high. Um, mm-hmm. Girlfriend Ben was for a couple years now. Mm. Um, but no, my Tinder profile will just be um, married, like married comedian, five daughters, one amazing girlfriend, must love movies, no kids, have a job. <laughs> okay, okay. I got five kids. Kid? I don't want to learn other kids. <laughs> I was gonna say five kids. That's a that's a lot of kids. Not just five kids. Five daughters. Five daughters. Like so I only have a son to drink a beer with and hide from him. So wait, wait. So you have a wife, you have a girlfriend, and you have five daughters. So yes. you have a household with seven women. Well, no, the girlfriend does not live here. Oh, fair enough. Fair enough. So six, but yeah, yeah. wow. It's so how did how is that going for you? Um very stressful, very like as I work, you know, I have a full time job because mm-hmm. you know, clearly my jokes aren't that good enough to uh, pay money yet. Mm-hmm. So until that goes somewhere, I have a full time job, I got the kids, I got the household. Mm-hmm. Uh like I said, I have five kids, but the newborn, she's only four months old. Well, congrats. So like yeah. I mean, you can say congrats, but it's kid number five. There's really not much you can congratulate me about. <laughs> but, like, Venmo me is better than thanks. I mean... Well, represent- I'll make sure there's a Venmo link down in, down in the description of this podcast where people could send, you know, donations to child number five. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we didn't even name it. It's just child number five. Well, I, that was my next question. So, yeah, okay, never mind. No, she does have a name. Of course. OJ. Oh yeah, I remember actually. It's and what does it stand for? Uh, well, hyphenated first name Olivia Jane. That's good but because like, obviously, if you say OJ now, people think of either orange juice or more likely OJ Simpson. OJ Simpson. So that's that exactly. Your, was that that's your what like, I comedic? Wanted. I was gonna say, was that on purpose? It, it was. I trolled my family because early on, I I suggested the name Olivia Jane mm-hmm. and. No one realized the initials, mm. and so months and months go by, and they just love the name. Mm-hmm. And I couldn't take it anymore. I finally told him, "Be like, yeah, I can't wait till she's born." And I just hold her and be like, "Oh, my little OJ, you're finally free." <laughs> nice. I but they see... love the name too much, and it's worse the jokes for me. And plus, when she's a kid, no one's gonna know about OJ, like. Yeah. The parents will, but classmates are not going to get it. That's the thing, isn't it? Like by the time your OJ is eighteen, twenty years old, I'm not quite sure whether that generation would even know of OJ Simpson. Like yeah, I no. barely know of him. Like I know him. Like I knew him mostly as a movie star, rather than you know the Naked Gun series and all that. And then I learned, oh wait, what did he do? <laughs> Yeah, and that, that's what I'm kind of banking on. Like, you know, by the time, like, it's not going to affect her too mm-hmm. much. Mm-hmm. No, I, I, I get, I bet, I bet. So, is it true? So, before we move on, I need to ask as a person who still, I don't have any kids, at least I know of. Um, and you, as a person with five kids, is it true what they say when it comes to, you know, your first firstborn, everything's stress. You know, there's, you know, you cannot sleep. You're always so stressed out about your firstborn. And then a second child comes and you kind of get a hang of it. Then a third one comes and it's like, uh, I can take it or leave it. And by the fourth and, you know, by the time fourth and fifth rolls around, it's like, yeah, whatever. It's a jungle. Anyway, you know, they just raise themselves now. Like, you know, basically you, you're not as stressed, you know, by the time, you know, child number four you know, three, four, five comes comes around. Oh, well, yeah, like, was number five, especially because of the age gap. Like, our oldest is 17, so she helps a lot. Mm-hmm. But also, like, I mean, parenting, it, it all depends on how much of a parent you, you want to be. Mm-hmm. Like, um, like, if you want, you could just never marry. If you just knock someone up and have a kid, mm-hmm. you know, you don't got to worry. She'll keep the kid. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can just pop in whenever you want. I mean, 
you can be completely stress free with a kid. Mm-hmm. I mean, as a guy, like this is like guys are kind of lucky that way. But like, if you actually want to be a responsible parent and be there for the kid and take care of them and provide, it is extremely stressful. Mm-hmm. And my advice to everyone I tell is don't have kids. Just, mm-hmm. just don't. Just work. Save your money. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like, just, just like it's cheaper to just live on your own. Like, mm-hmm. especially like, if you still have your parents, live at home for as long as fucking possible, and just keep saving, saving, saving. Because like, like I don't know how it is uh, where you're at, which mm-hmm. we just talked about right before the show. I know it. Uh, Scotland, yeah, Scotland, really cool country. I wanted to say Switzerland. I knew there was an S. I get, I'll give myself a half credit on that. Yeah, but here everything is like way expensive now. Mm-hmm. Uh, like I wish I was living at home with my parents mm-hmm. and just saving money. But yeah, delay kids for as long as possible. Like, like don't even worry about kids. Like, if you have siblings, just be a really cool uncle or aunt. That's where I am actually right now because so just to answer your question, yes, Scotland is also quite expensive or you know everything you know after COVID it seems everywhere is expensive you know it's just and we've been hit twice by Brexit because Brexit but, was a great idea oh you're right yeah so you know in the UK in general you know politicians don't want to talk about it openly because they don't want to piss off many people but yeah we kind of been hit twice and Many people have already talked about it openly, except for the people in power. But that's a discussion for another matter. But <laughs> to your point about being a cool uncle, that's actually who I am. <laughs> well, I don't know about cool, but I am an uncle. Uh, because my sister, who's actually younger than me by almost a year, she's already has she's already got two kids, two boys, and they are seven and four. So now they are at the stage where you know they're talking, they're walking fine. So you can actually have fun with them. You can, you know, talk to them. And yeah, I'm just that cool uncle who lives in Scotland and they cannot wait to visit this summer. And yeah, it's always like, I always tell tell my girlfriend, see, I love kids, especially when those kids are not my own. Because then... Those are the best can, kind. Exactly. You can have fun with them, right? You can, you know, take them to a park. You can... I don't know. You can do whatever you want with them, right? And then yeah, once they start missing, especially if you take them to an island. <laughs> I, well. I wouldn't. I don't have an island, and I also I would not not into that. <laughs> no, but like again, and once they start to misbehave, it's like sorry, not my kid, not my kid. You know, I'll just pick up the phone or I'll just say, say to my sister, "Your kid is misbehaving. Just do something about it." Like you know, not my kid. Like you know, as they say, not not my circus, not my monkeys. You know, not my problem. Yeah. Like- it's not stressful to be an uncle. <laughs> exactly. I'm just reaping all the benefits by, you know, having these two great boys around and they are just adorable and no responsibility, which is a dream, really. So, yeah. Plus, I mean, the world's going to hell anyway. So, why bring kids into it? It's the, you know, the prospects of, for the future are not great, no matter how you look at it. That is like, true. I mean, you know, we're at the point where, like, Armageddon doesn't sound that bad. Or many people are like, you know what? I've been, you know, I spent 20 minutes on the internet. We need, we are due for like a reset. <laughs> yeah, the giant meteor reset button. Yes. But anyway, you know, before we go get all doom and gloomy. So you said you're based in Delaware. Yes. So if I were to tell you, hey, Frank, I'm coming to Delaware for a week. Where should I go? What do I need to see? Where should I eat? You know, what would you say? All right, you're coming from Scotland yes. to, in theory, United States, Delaware. Yes. Like, it's not worth it. Like, there's, <laughs> like, I mean, you're in, like, there's a million places a lot closer to you. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Delaware, I got nothing to offer you. Like, if you, like, lived in, like, Maryland, which is, like, the next state over, I can come up with some stuff we can do. Like, hey, let's go. You know, maybe go crabbing, catch some crabs, or go down to the beach. Mm-hmm. But like, if you're coming from Scotland, you want to go to the beach, go to Florida, go to California. Mm-hmm. Like, like unless you're really into American history, maybe go to Philadelphia, which is close by. But mm-hmm. like, I so would Philadelphia be better question than 
if you know if I were to say let's go to Philadelphia for a week, would you tell me okay we need to see this we need to visit there we need to eat at this place? Uh, unless you really want to try a Philadelphia cheesesteak, or like you said, if you're in American history, I'm gonna show you a cracked broken bell. Mm -hmm. Uh, but yeah, I I like go to New York, like or Atlantic City, hit up casinos, like. Mm -hmm. But if you want to have casinos and you're traveling from Scotland, mm -hmm. which I mean, I've always wanted that. Like people that live in like places that people would love to vacation someday, mm -hmm. where do they go to vacation? Like I don't know why. Like if you're coming to the U.S., mm -hmm. Delaware, and Philadelphia shouldn't even be in like the top ten, really. <laughs> like yeah. Well, to be fair, I'm not. You know. When I say I live in Scotland, I live in a like quite a big city. I don't live, in, you know, amongst the sheep on a cliff, someplace like where you've seen a Highlander, or something like that. Because yeah, every yeah everybody, you know, when I say oh, I live in Scotland, everybody, you know, that's the first thing they picture like whiskey, some sheep, some greens, and it's just like oh, that must be beautiful. And then if you were to see the city I live in, it's like just a your stereotypical kind of industrial-ish city. So it's like yeah, but I feel like I feel like the Scotland we see in movies is like what a two-hour drive. Not um, even to be honest. Look now, no, no, <laughs> like to be honest, that's a great advantage of no matter where you live, no matter if you live down south, north, northeast. Where well, I live, northeast. You, if you have a car, you are maybe half an hour, hour away tops from something stunning. Like we have, you know, we have beautiful coasts. We have some like castles. We have, we have some beaches, even though the temperature here, you cannot really, even in the summer, you cannot really chill at those beaches for that. Well, you can chill there, but it's not like you can actually, you know, go to the sea and take a swim. Yeah, because like, the, like because you the... got castles. Like, exactly. can you buy a castle? Technically, well, if you're super rich, anything is possible. Oh man, I forgot what's online, but there's some place has like castles everywhere that you can just buy. And like my uncle is like, if you buy a castle, like how do you get Wi-Fi in there? Like it has to be a pain to like modernize a castle, I would imagine. Exactly. And I now I actually stumbled upon a web page that technically sells you uh what is it, a title of like a la like lord and lady of like uh some Scottish dance, and because he technically will own like a certain piece of property. But if you read their, you know, terms and conditions, you will not. They will own it on your behalf. So it's, you know, so it's a nice piece of paper you will pay several hundred dollars for to be called Lord and Lady. <laughs> so it's, you know, capitalism. It's it's rampant, I'm telling you. Mm -hmm. but like, like, where? what's your dream vacation location that you want to go to? Dream vacation location? Like, I'll... I don't really have one. I have like top three things or top three places I would love to go to right now, which one of them would be New York because I've always wanted to go to New York. The other would be Rio de Janeiro, like Brazil, because I am fascinated by like South America. And the third one I'm hoping to do next year would be Japan because Japan, like my my boss is just returned from Japan. He He was there for like three weeks and he absolutely adored it. And yeah, I've always wanted to go and seeing his pictures, seeing what he, you know, how he, and hearing what he's been through, how he described it, how great of a time he had. I was like, well, hopefully next year. Yeah, I've traveled to uh, Nashville before, okay. which is a 14 hour drive. Mm -hmm. Now, for you, I just did a quick Google search. I don't know where in Scotland you are, but. Mm -hmm. A 14-hour drive from Scotland, you can be in Amsterdam. Yes. Like, I'd be there, like, every weekend. I mean, on technicality, you couldn't because, you know, we are, like, UK is an island, so there's no direct, <laughs> like, route. Like, no, but, like, yeah, no, you, technically, I think, what is it? From the north, from the very north of Scotland to the very uh, south of England, I think, technically, you can do it in, like, 16 hours or so. It's, you know, it's not that far so yeah like for you you know for again exactly for americans you drive around for 14 hours and you are in tennessee right <laughs> yeah and for us we are literally in the bottom of the island yeah like you know ireland scotland mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, london amsterdam i don't know how far away paris is but to me i feel like for you that'd be like if i was in delaware and i traveled to florida like mm -hmm. 
No, you Paris have a ton is of like locations a... there. Oh no, me I can travel like three thousand miles to get to hit somewhere like cool. Like yeah, no, Paris uh, is like an hour by a plane. Like yeah, I could hop on a plane and in an hour I'm in Paris. Yes. See, to me as an American, that makes it sound like you are a billionaire over <laughs> there. Like yeah, Paris, I'll be there in an hour. Yeah, have lunch on top of the Eiffel Tower. Maybe pick up a baguette. I don't know what they eat. <laughs> actually, actually, uh, uh, fair, uh, lucky, like, or funny that you mentioned that. I do have a colleague who does this. Like, I have a colleague who, because we work on shift basis, four days, you know, off, four days on. He uses those days off to travel. So he would often go to like Ireland for two days. So he would catch a plane for pretty cheap price, or you know, he knows how to book it, and goes for two days to Ireland. So yeah, and then he comes back just you know to work, and then he would go to France. He would go to like Latvia, Lithuania, you know, all these like okay. tiny countries around. See that that that's the life. Mm-hmm. I'm in America. Like if I want to do that, like I got like I gotta not get sick at work for like six months, save up my vacation, get a passport, get a hotel, travel, fly like two days just to get there. Mm-hmm. And it's like you're just like I'm just taking a weekend. Yeah, but then America is such a vast, you know, continent. You know, it's such a vast. Like, you know, you can go to California, you can go to New York, you can go to like if you, even if you wanted, you can be the stereotypical American and go to Mexico for a, you know, for you know, for a holiday, and it still be closer, you know, yeah. experience but, something new. But like, really study that map and look at Delaware and just be like, everything good worth doing is like a day, day and a half of just traveling. So like I can't even like really go anywhere cool on a weekend if I yeah. wanted. Like I don't know. Like like I sometimes I also want like okay people that live in Hawaii where do they go for vacation? They live in Hawaii. Like mm-hmm. where where else do you need to go really? Maybe they go to Delaware <laughs> just to experience something new. Like it's weird. Like we do have people that vacation to Delaware. They go down to the beaches, but normally like. Delaware, I think, is a good place for people to probably retire because we have tax-free shopping. Oh. But other than that, we got nothing to offer. Oh, and we are a giant... We have tax loopholes, so, like, almost every giant company in the world is registered to the same building in Wilmington. Oh, okay. I wasn't ever aware of that. Okay. Yeah, like, there's just this one tiny lawyer's office in a building to where all they do is collect mail for all these giant companies. Mm -hmm. Like, Delaware, we would probably be the richest state in the country Mm -hmm. if we just even charge, like, one quarter of a percentage point for companies registered here. (laughs) But now we're struggling because we're going to just create all these giant loopholes for corporations to register in Delaware. Capitalism. Yep, gotta love it. Yep. Well, you've convinced me never to go to deliver. <laughs> so with that, on that know. note, <laughs> on that note, let's move to this or that. A simple game where I give you two options and you choose which one would you rather. And this, right. you know, ranges from and if from silly to possibly philosophical. So let's see what we have. Frank, big party or small gathering? Ooh, small gathering. Mm-hmm. Unless I'm trying to push my stand-up stuff <laughs> <laughs> that's fair tv shows or movies oh that, that is an even tougher one there was a day where i'd be like movies all day mm-hmm. but netflix has just broken me with television shows because it's weird i can like watch 10 episodes of a show in one day mm-hmm. but i cannot bring myself to watch lord of the rings trilogy again there's something about those breaks in between the episodes isn't it well not just the breaks, it's just story wise, you know, mm-hmm. you, you know, get the peaks and the valleys, you know, the story builds up and you get a conclusion in a lot shorter of a time. Mm-hmm. So it's more like, you know, in your brain, it's like, oh, you've been rewarded. So it's like, why am I going to watch three movies for one reward when I can just spend 12 hours getting 12 of those hits? Yeah, the attention span is shortening for every single one of us due to mm-hmm. our devices. And younger kids, especially kids, oh, Jesus Christ, they have it yeah. much worse. Well, you would know. Yeah, like like this morning I watched uh, Aquaman 2, and mm-hmm. that's just because I had a couple hours where I was home alone, so I was just typing on the computer, had the movie going, and that's kind of rare for me to do that because 
the other downside of having both a wife and a girlfriend and also mm-hmm. kids, it's like if there's a movie and someone else wants to watch it, it's like, okay, I can't watch that until they're ready to watch it. Mm-hmm. Because like if I watch a movie and I hate it, mm-hmm. but they want to watch it, I'm going to have to sit through it again. Yeah. And I just realized I'm going to have to fucking do that with Aquaman 2. <laughs> Who this is what I did. This is what I get for taking some me time to watch a movie. Mm-hmm. Is it the wife or the girlfriend who who really wants to watch Aquaman 2? Probably the girlfriend. Uh, big Jason Mem- Momoa fan? No, just like you know, comic book movie is something we've been watching for a couple years. I see. And this is the first one I watched like solo. Mm-hmm. And he's paid <laughs> and the price. I, I, I'm, yeah. I'm going to be like, you, you can just watch it. Like, <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. So, but I feel like if I say that, then she'll already know the mm-hmm. movie is shit. Because like I, except for Twitter, I'll gladly tell her what say what movies I hate on there. Mm-hmm. But when it comes to, like actually like people, I don't want to like shit on any movie mm-hmm. because I want them to be able to watch and kind of like form their own opinion. Yep. No, I totally but, get it. But like, I feel like oh Frank said shit, it must be shitty, and then they just start looking at it negatively. Mm-hmm. And I I prefer people to watch any movie with like an open mind. Mm-hmm. But I I can't hold back on uh, Aquaman too. That's fair. No, that's why I always say to you know I'm the movie guy for many of my you know friends and coworkers. But I always say, but I have a unique taste. So just because I like or dislike something, that doesn't mean you will like it or dislike it. So you know, give it a shot. Because, you know, many times I'm you know, liking weird movies and people will be like, what the fuck are you watching? I, I mean, that's always one of my go-to favorite ones. Like, if I really don't want to talk about a movie mm-hmm. that I didn't like, I'll just be like, I can see why people would enjoy it. It just, it wasn't for me. Mm-hmm. But there are some movies where, like, I know going in, like, I am not the audience for this. I am going to hate it. Yeah. And only one movie have I walked into going, I am not the audience for this. I am going to hate it. And I walked out loving and, and that was, was Dungeons and Dragons. The new oh, one. nice. Like, they advertised that movie wrong. They just need to say it was from the people that wrote Game Night. Yeah, the trailer. Yeah, I'm actually 100% there with you. The trailer didn't inspire any confidence. And also, I've never played a single, you know, Dungeons and Dragons, like, game. Like, I know yeah, what it too. is about, but I've never actually done it. So I was like... I don't know if I'm going to enjoy the movie. And then I watched it. And well, with my girlfriend and we both again, and she's in the same boat. She's never played a game. Uh, and we both loved it. She, we were both laughing. So we had a good time. Like all the trailer needed to add in was from the writers of game night. Yes. And that's what I see. And that's what I told her to sell, to sell her on it because I was like, oh, it's from the guys who did game night. And we liked it. And she was like, oh, OK, we can watch it then. <laughs> so, yeah. Anyway, money or free time. Money. Oh, care to explain? Um, I just know me. Like mm-hmm. I work a lot of overtime at work because mm-hmm. money. I am literally giving up free time for mm-hmm. money. And technically, now, that's a... with money, you can buy free time. You know, with yeah. money, you can, you can outsource tasks you don't want to do to different people. Yeah. So, yeah, money. I'm at the point in my life where I need to keep making money and saving money. And hopefully I live long enough to retire with free time. Mm-hmm. Especially with five kids. Knowing me, I'm never going to retire. <laughs> Maybe you will be but... so successful with your stand-up comedy that, you know, you will never have to retire and you'll be one of them guys like 60 and still going strong doing stand-up. That, that would be a dream come true. See? We can always hope. Yep. So honesty you... or other people's feelings? Honesty or what? Or other people's feelings. Hmm. Mm. That that is a tough one because mm. I well I feel like you can be honest and not hurt people's feelings, mm-hmm. um, but if I have to say a hard truth, I know it's gonna hurt people. I will do that. Mm-hmm. So I'm gonna have to go with honesty. Yep, I'm in the same boat, same exact boat. Mm. Like um, I feel like lying just hurts them more, 100%. and like. When I try to get the truth out of my kids, I tell them, like, you got to tell me the truth. Like, I don't even care. I won't even be mad. Mm-hmm. But if you're lying to me and then I find out, I, I'll i be through the roof. Mm-hmm. That's why I get angry. So. No, I get you. I get you. Probably the most important question of all, 
Ninjas or pirates? Ninjas. Why? Well, ninjas, I feel, only hurt people that kind of deserve it. Mm -hmm. We still got pirates today that are just out there hijacking, uh, trying to like hijack cruise ships, hurt people, steal, being Mm -hmm. pirates. So, plus, I mean, I know for a fact we have pirates. Yes. I've never seen a ninja. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's how effective they are. Exactly. So, if I've never seen a ninja, means I don't have a ninja problem to worry about. And also, I love the Ninja Turtles, so... <laughs> See? Love the Ninja Turtles, hate Pirates of the Caribbean. <laughs> All right. Well, here's a man who's got his priorities straight, I and I appreciate that. Well, free, free will or destiny? <laughs> Freedom or destiny? No, free will. Oh, free will or destiny. Mm-hmm. I feel like they're kind of one and the same. Um, however, Ooh. I don't believe destiny is real. Um, okay. Free will... It, well, free will is kind of an illusion. Mm. Like, no one really has free will. Like, yeah, you have decisions you want to make, but at the end of the day, you got to be working at a full-time job. That's mm-hmm. not free will. Like, I don't know how it is over there, but over here, you know, 40 hours a week, five mm-hmm. days a week, is, you know, that's what we do here. I hear there are magical places in other countries where they have four-day work weeks. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I hate those countries. We need to bomb them, get them off the map. Mm-hmm. Because if I'm miserable five days a week, everyone else needs to be too. Yeah. Would it be rather than freedom rather than free will? What are you talking about with the, you know, four days? Like you have to work, therefore you don't have a free will. Wouldn't that argument be more about like those are like laws? And yeah, we have to still obey the laws, but you still have the free will not to obey those laws, you know? Yeah, but I mean, my takeaway is more of I don't have free will because I work for a company in mm-hmm. which they dictated when I have free time. Mm-hmm. And that space, I can do kind of whatever I want as long as it doesn't break the law. Okay. Then they've already decided that end time when I have to return to work. Mm-hmm. Now, I mean, I do have the free will to not work at all. Mm-hmm. And... I also have free will to do drugs if I wanted to. But I'm not going to live a life worth kind of living mm-hmm. if I did that. Mm-hmm. Um, so I guess this is more of a philosophical question of what exactly is free will. Mm-hmm. Like Free will, I feel, is fiction. Like You really only have it in like the Star Trek universe where, you know, money isn't holding you down. Mm-hmm. Okay. But that said, you no, know, I am lucky enough to live in a country where we have a lot of freedoms that a lot of places don't have, mm-hmm. and we take for granted here. Mm-hmm. Um, so at the end of the day, I would probably choose freedom over free will. Okay. Uh, as far as what destiny is, I feel you you make your own destiny, mm-hmm. which that's a great idea to have, mm-hmm. but a lot harder to achieve, but Ah, man, this is a tough one. Free will or destiny? Well, I would rather have free will. I guess it's a real actual thing. Yeah, that's fine. That's And that's perfectly fine. And so I just went all over the map to the- get to... You're just asking what I would rather have. Yes. And I'm just trying to like burden you with the reality of mm-hmm. my life. <laughs> No, no, no. And it's perfectly fine. This is what the, this podcast is for. Just to, you know, examine who you are. And I'm uh, I'm having a blast. Uh, so this is great. Uh, last question. Would you rather, rather time travel twice or teleport infinite times? Um, well, if I time travel, mm-hmm. I know I would just probably not do anything useful with that. Mm-hmm. I do want to travel a lot. So I'll go with teleport. Mm-hmm. Okay. Like, if I'm going to time travel twice, what is that? Like, I go back in time, buy a bunch of stock certificates for Apple, put them in this lockbox, go back to where I'm at, dig it up. Mm-hmm. Or, buy a bunch of, or buy a bunch of Bitcoins in 2008 for pennies. Not even pennies. Yeah. Ah, fuck. You know, you, you talked me into time travel twice. <laughs> Especially with you, say, you know, saying, you know, you would rather have money than free time. I thought yeah. you, you you just take that and you just like you know tell your younger self in two thousand eight, hey, 
I know you don't you don't know what this is, but buy you know ten thousand or hundred thousand of bitcoins and don't make sure you never lose them and don't you know sell some in two thousand sixteen and sell the rest around two thousand twenty one. Thank me later. Well, I mean, I went to college in Philadelphia, and at night I would just walk a lot. Mm -hmm. And one night, you know, there's like homeless, like there's tons of homeless people everywhere, mm -hmm. but this one guy just started screaming and yelling about there's no future life mm -hmm. is not worth living and then he just runs off was that me from the future coming back talking to younger me to just be like look man fucking eat it like just just get a little sad open up the oven that's yeah, cool yeah, disturbing that's and philosophical <laughs> <laughs> like maybe i do end up choosing time travel in the future and that's what i just did right there maybe that'd be a great That'd be great to waste of time traveling and <laughs> just be like, hey man, it's it's not worth it. It's not worth it. Yeah, it's not working out, man. <laughs> Peace. Here, here's a handgun, there's an alley. Do what you gotta do. <laughs> oh well. So see seeing you as a person who's not afraid to speak his mind, you have any hot takes you would like to share with us? I do, and my hot take actually comes from the red book. Okay. Because I wrote a joke down and I told it to someone. And the joke was I always wanted to fight a midget because I wanted to know what it's like to be on this side of child abuse. <laughs> and that was a simple joke. But then, mm -hmm. you know, luckily they reminded me that, well, apparently it is a problem of people mm -hmm. infantizing, you know, the midgets. Okay. And treat them like children, and that is bad. And that is exactly what my joke was kind of implying. Mm -hmm. And then they also reminded me that they're not called midgets. They're little people. Yes. And my issue with that is I have kids. Mm -hmm. They are like little people. Mm -hmm. They have their personalities. So I call my children little people. So therefore, calling a midget a little person is infantizing them. And you just said that was bad, so midget's the correct word. Interesting. Yep, it that's was a, like a little snake eating its own tail there. Like That's a fascinating but, way to look at this issue. Yeah. Hmm. You don't want us to infantize them. You mm -hmm. want us to call them little people. Children are indeed little people, that but they're true. not midgets. So midget is the key identifier. That is my hot take. There is nothing wrong with the word midget. All right. <laughs> I have a few, like... See, like, I, I know there are certain words we shouldn't say. And, like, you know, and this word being one of them. I never, for example, understood why we cannot say the word retard anymore. Because, like, especially in, the, like, you know, older movies and the TV shows. And not even older. Even, like, early 2000s. You hear it a lot. Like, here's like, my take on it. the word. Mm -hmm. And it was with my, hold on, one, two, three, kid number four. Okay. When she was born, the doctors had to spend 42 minutes doing CPR trying to revive her. She was dead. Oh. And while they were still working on her, mm -hmm. before she even came back, the doctor came to me. And this is exactly what he said. It's etched into my memory. He said, do you want us to keep trying to save her? If she does make it, she is going to be extremely retarded. Mm -hmm. And that doctor used it and like he used it in the actual like correct way. Yes. And it was still kind of jarring to hear. Like mm -hmm. I before that moment, I heard that word all the time. I'd say it all the time, playing Call of Duty. Like, you know, mm -hmm. a guy team kills, call him a fucking retard. And I feel like that is a word that can be said. Mm-hmm. As long it is not to an actual person with disabilities. No, that's the thing. Like, because, you know, that was my point, right? So and you don't want to mock people. So, yeah. you know, I, you, I wouldn't say it like, well, first of all, I don't actually say it. I just think, you know, yeah. I just think there is a, when people think it's like, oh, it's a, one of the unspeakable words. I'm like, why? Because like, you know, obviously, again, we shouldn't say to the actual people who have mental disabilities. That, that's Actually, obviously, you're that's wrong. Now you're discriminating, but no. no. Um, but it's that's wrong. But you know, if you say, say to your mate, like, again, I don't. But you know, if you were to say to your mate, your mate, you hearing like this word, like I'm like, 
I don't I don't know. Like I, I just I just feel like it's it shouldn't be that big of a deal. Well then like, like language changes yes. all the time over years. Um and to me, like the general use of like I also have a bit about that in the red book too. But like I grew I was born in eighty five. I grew up in the nineties. All throughout the nineties, we would call stuff gay and retarded all the time. Yep. Like we called something gay. All we did all that was was just us saying like another word to say weird. Yep. And or if we called a friend, you know, you're acting like a retard. We're also just calling them weird. Mm-hmm. Now we could just say the word weird, mm-hmm. but apparently in the nineties we just wanted to come up we wanted to say anything else except weird. Yes. Like gay, retarded, butt munch, anything. Mm-hmm. Except just saying weird. Mm-hmm. Um, with that said, I do not say retarded a lot. It's kind of one of those things where, like, it's like old reliable. It's there on the shelf, covered in dust. Mm-hmm. Every now and then, something happens, and you just gotta you gotta dust it off and use it. It can be mm-hmm. used selectively, just not as much as we were dropping it in the nineties mm-hmm. or early two thousands, two thousand tens on uh, Call of Duty lobbies. Yeah. I've never like been part of those lobbies. Yeah, no, I've never been part of those lobbies because even when I used to game, I I actually I was one of the weird ones that preferred <laughs> single player games rather than multiplayer games. Mm. Uh so yeah, never bothered me. But yeah, like again, like same thing. I don't really use it. I would never use it especially to describe somebody, but like I also what my point was, well, you know, I don't think it should be one of those banned words like you know there are certain words that are like off limits you know and they're off limits for a reason i don't think necessarily this one is that so that yeah but you know that's interesting yeah like there are words that um like i even though they go on drug side there are certain words i still won't say Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um I'm not really sure what's going on with this one. I don't have this one prepared. So it's always touchy when you're talking about words you should or shouldn't say. Okay. You might just say it and then it get taken out of context later. Mm-hmm. Like um like in the 90s, like we were pretty much when you're younger and especially in the nineties, probably today. I don't know what kids are like on the schoolyard now. Mm-hmm. I'm sure they're saying like every possible thing under the sun. Mm-hmm. But then as you grow up and become more mature, you figure out when and when not is the appropriate time to use such words. Mm-hmm. And like, I know with like stand up, like a lot of comedians do get canceled for saying words like, you know, retard or uh, drop in the N word. If mm-hmm. you may not have that kind of credibility, mm-hmm. like if you watch Neil Brennan, he is a white guy who gets away with saying it. Okay. And the way he does it in his stories and crafts his jokes as an audience, like, okay, yeah, cool, he can say. It. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and for Neil Brennan, if you don't know, he was like the main writer on like Chappelle's show. Oh, I see. And like he his stand up specials are amazing. He has also I know this is your podcast, but he also has a podcast called Blocks where he interviews like other comedians and people go into like a deep dive, which is amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, so I recommend that. And but yeah, like any word can be said when it's crafted from the from stand-up point of view. Any word can be said if it's crafted in a joke the correct way with the correct context. Mm-hmm. So cancer culture, I don't believe is kind of an actual thing. Like you can't really cancel people can find offense to it. But like when a comedian says a word that they shouldn't and you see it get blown up and people are highly offended. Mm-hmm. Well, the other side of offense is the people go on, it's a joke. It's not it's a joke. It's not offensive. Like Yeah. There's yeah. that side. The less vocal side. Mm-hmm. And really you just gotta talk think about yourself and what you're comfortable with. Mm-hmm. But for me, as long as nothing is coming from a mean spirit or from a place of actual hate, mm-hmm. it should be okay. 
And see, this is the thing, right? So I really appreciate this because you. I feel like you might be the first person I've had on who actually had a proper hot take. So I do appreciate that, first of all. And secondly, you know, you have this unique take on it because, of course, you are actually doing stand-up comedy. So, you know, there is obviously there is the... You are you have to have the vulnerability to go on that stage like night after night and just put yourself out there. And of and as you mentioned, you have your little red book where you have a lot of inappropriate jokes, a lot of maybe off color jokes. And it's just yeah, it's just you know, so it's always to me been fascinating talking to, you know, people and then listening. I haven't had a chance to talk to any comedians besides you. But I would love to talk to more comedians and get their takes because, yeah, I would imagine it would be quite similar as long as you can craft the joke around certain word that you shouldn't be used. But nowadays, that's just going to get clipped, isn't it? You know, you're just yep. going to get clipped that one you know, sentence without the anything before, anything after, and it's just going to be out of the context. Yep. Like um, the comedian I mentioned earlier... Uh, Tony Edgecliff, Hedgecliff, I think he was his name. Mm-hmm. Um, he got quote unquote canceled because uh, Asian comedian introduced him. He walked out on stage and then did, I think, I believe, an impersonation or mocked the guy and made kind of an off color, somewhat racist joke. Ooh. And that was the clip and he got canceled. But the full. Like if you look at the whole set and look at everything in context, that person he was making fun of is a close personal friend that was introducing them, and they have a back and forth where they do that with each other. Mm-hmm. So that's the unclipped part of it. Yeah. But you never know what's going to get clipped. Mm-hmm. That's, that is the dangerous part about being a comedian. The good part is if it gets clipped and gets traction, your name gets out there. And you're going to pick up some views. <laughs> you know, maybe this conversation will eventually get clipped and will be used against both of us. Because right. yeah. if, that, if that's the case, I'm going to just read a random thing from the Red Book. <laughs> All right. It's hard to tell the difference between a woman playing hard to get and rape victim. <laughs> Have fun clipping that, Aaron. <laughs> <laughs> okay. This See, this is exactly my type of humor. I don't know if you know this comedian, so and he's actually Scottish, and I I've known about him before I moved here. Actually, his name is Frankie Boyle, and mm. he so first of all he's got an incredibly like thick Scot uh, like Glaswegian accent, so many Americans find him difficult to like you know difficult to understand him. But if you do, and if you actually delve into his sets, he is very crafty a phenomenal with his words like so he would often joke about he often jokes about and goes to places where most comedians would not dare to go like he quote unquote makes fun of disabled people but he doesn't you know he always says he and he always says that like you know if we treat like disabled people for example as a second class citizens and we are not allowed to make jokes about them they are not you know they are not uh that kind of puts them in a separate category and it kind of, you know, it kind of differs them from us and they are not any different. You know, they shouldn't be any different. So, you know, it should be open playing field for everybody. And I kind of like that attitude and I kind of like that logic. Like, you know, if you, uh, this, you know, if you or if we cannot joke about this one group of people, this one group of people for A, B and C, well, doesn't that kind of alienate that uh, group of people even more? Well, okay, so... It is like you can craft jokes for anybody. Mm-hmm. I think it'd be acceptable, but like I said earlier, it all com- it all depends on where it's coming from. Yes. Like Dave Chappelle, he's been in trouble for about making trans jokes. Yeah. Now, he, have you seen his newest special? No, but I heard a lot of things. Okay, so my girlfriend had never seen any Dave Chappelle stand up, mm-hmm. and first of all. About my amazing girlfriend. Um, she does have a disability. Uh, many years ago, she was in a car accident. She's paraplegic mm-hmm. and, you know, has a wheelchair. That's that's what happens when you break your back mm-hmm. or it's fine. And so I showed her Dave's first stand up, uh, Killing Him Softly. That's it. 
and we laughed a lot. There were a couple of jokes that have an H2O, but had a great time. Mm. So then we decided to then put in his newest one, which was a little fitting because he filmed it at the same place as he did Killing Him Softly. Mm -hmm. And his first big joke ended up being a trans joke. And, you know, he mentions, like, he jokes about how that's he's not going to joke about him anymore. He's gotten into enough trouble with that. And that's why, and this is his words, he said, and that's why for the rest of the set, he's just going to make fun of the disabled. Mm -hmm. And I'm with my girlfriend, and I just know, I'm like, I'm going to have to turn this off. Mm -hmm. And I did. I'm like, nope, we did something else, because, I mean, like, I have seen, like, I watched the movies before that's done jokes about the disabled, and it it is it can be very offensive mm -hmm. and so i turned the Chappelle special off next day when i'm alone i decide to listen to the rest of that bit mm -hmm. and i am glad i turned it off because the rest of that bit would have had her in tears because everything he says following that is not funny it is intentionally mean for the sake of being mean and just tears into an entire group in a way they do not deserve Mm -hmm. and I know he was just doing that to just grab more headlines because he knows controversy brings in views. Yeah. And one thing you know about Netflix, Netflix does not care at all about quality mm -hmm. or what it does as long as it gets eyeballs on it. Mm -hmm. And it sucks. Like I do not have any, like I don't even try to touch disability jokes. Mm-hmm. Uh, the girlfriend, she's filmed me a couple good ones, and like I made somewhat playful comments or kind of jokes with her. Now, the place where I go to almost every week to tell jokes, there's a hilarious comedian. I wish I could promote him and say his name. I, all I know is his name is Joey. Like, it's weird. I'm horrible with names when it comes to actual people I know and talk with. I really need mm -hmm. to figure out the last name, but. Um, he is a war vet and he um, is a double amputee. Okay. And he has amazing, amazing disability jokes. Mm -hmm. And which I'm not even going to try to go over any of them because that's, you know, another comedian's material. I'm not going to yep. try to say it, but like there is a space in that area of non offensive and offensive mm -hmm. where you can play with and craft jokes. But what Chappelle did in that special wasn't crafting jokes. It was the low-hanging fruit, like, lowest denominator offensive jokes. Mm -hmm. and it was sad to see, like, watching his amazing special, Killing Him Softly, and just going right to, like, a never seen a big enough drop-off mm -hmm. before, like, quality. But it's the thing we talked about before, isn't it? It's if you coming from a some sort of good place or not malicious place, you know, the jokes actually can land. But if you, you know, again, I have not seen the special, so I cannot judge it. But based on what he's saying, it just seems like he was just going for the long, long hanging fruit. And it's yeah. probably not going to work if you're just going to go for that. Exactly. So just, yeah. But again, I, I've actually read your review on Letterboxd for that. So I was like, well, damn, Frank really didn't enjoy it. <laughs> yeah and i did tough it out and did watch like the entirety of it before doing any kind of review mm -hmm. and it does not redeem itself at all mm -hmm. like there are a ton of comedians where they know they are crossing a line and they're intentionally doing it mm -hmm. but they craft their stories in a way in which it circles back around like mm -hmm. anthony jesselnick he is amazing at doing that mm -hmm. But he has a whole bit about, you know, dropping babies. Mm -hmm. And then just circles back around to where you're out of it being possibly offensive to that's where you're taking a story, bravo, good joke. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty much every joke that man does is like, here's the line, I'm crossing it, but I'm taking audience with him and then bringing you right back to this side of okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Again, I would recommend if you haven't already Frankie Boyle. I think you might like him as if as oh, long I... as you can understand him. He has a thick Glaswegian accent. 
but also he also references quite a lot of British or UK stuff, so I'm not quite sure how well that would translate to the American perspective. Because even I don't get some of his jokes because they reference very niche stuff that has happened in the UK. Mm. But he's, again, but he's one of those who, yes, he goes there, but there's always a point behind the corner. So, you you know, you you think, oh, he just went there for a cheap punch, and then he turns around, and then there's a punchline to it that's even greater than any you have not seen coming. I'm like, all right, this is why I like him. I'll try and find some stuff. I did a quick uh, Apple Music search and didn't find any albums, so I'll mm. definitely look them up on YouTube later. Yeah. No, he. I think he's got a couple of like Netflix on on Netflix here at least. He didn't. He doesn't have any Netflix specials because again, he's been comic. He's been doing stand up comedy. I think since maybe nineties or early two thousands. So but yeah. it it's weird. Like um, I cannot remember the name. But did you ever watch a uh, Penn and Teller fool us? I know what it is, but I have not actually watched like a full episodes. But I know the show, yes. But like the first couple seasons, they had a host. Mm-hmm. And like I was like, oh, okay, he's a pretty good host. And then I ended up looking him up one day and find out like over, I guess in your side of the planet, he was like a big comedian. And I was like, wow, they had a big time comedian from over there on a U.S. show hosting it. Mm-hmm. And just, oh, it's just always weird when I find out like people are comedians. I like, yeah, they're. They seem to like comedians from other countries seem to know how to host US game shows or mm-hmm. <laughs> programs and it's interesting to me. Do you remember his name? I do not. Uh, That's okay. To... <laughs> That's all right. Well, again, thank you so much for this bit, for this debate, because I think this was fascinating to talk to somebody who actually does this, you know, stand up comedy and actually goes out there and, you know, puts some out there like every night. So Unless you have any more hot takes, we can move to the flex part of this podcast and actually talk talk about some movies. All right, Mel Gibson. He yeah. said Jews control Hollywood, mm-hmm. and then he stopped having a movie career. <laughs> Whenever a celebrity says the Jews control the media, they seem to disappear. So you know what that means? They need to just stop saying ignorant shit. Like coincidence? I, I don't not, think so. I'm not implying they control the media. I'm saying don't say anything offensive and along those lines. Mm. On the off chance that they do control it, him kind of not doing movies anymore kind of proves his point a little. But he kind of does. He still does. But no, nah, he was he, he he was being racist or not he, racist. Uh, he was well anti-Semitic. Was, yeah, anti-Semitic. That's the word. Yeah. He was racist for other stuff. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But. Anyway, that's the end of my hot takes. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, before we get cancelled, you know, before we both get cancelled, let's move to the flex part of the podcast. So, All Frank, right. tell me, what is the last new movie you have rated 5 out of 5? And la- last or new movie, anything, you know, 2020s onward? Uh, Godzilla minus one. Nice. Bottoms. Very nice. I uh, still yeah. haven't seen Bottoms, so tell me about tell me about it because I've seen Godzilla minus one and it's excellent. But tell me about it, why should I watch Bottoms? Right? Bottoms is a very outlandish comedy okay. in which it does jokes that probably on paper just shouldn't work, but it's like you just go with it, and mm-hmm. it it had me dying. There's a lot of stuff that they they do very subtly that if you're not paying enough attention to, you're not going to realize it. Mm-hmm. It, it is a period piece set in like the early 2000s okay but they don't tell you that uh-huh. but like because we're just watching like we're just, as we're watching it looking at it and the guy's like making calls and it's like where do you get the yellow pages from <laughs> and it's like are they doing that just as a joke and like if you're looking at it like okay this is a modern day movie okay they're just doing these props as jokes mm-hmm but once you realize it's set in early 2000s, a lot of stuff just clicks and it works. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it is just not, almost nonstop laughs throughout the entire thing. Okay. Um, have you seen TV show The Bear? Still, it's on my ever-growing watch, you know, watch list. It's yeah. on my queue, and it's very top to the key, of the queue because I've heard so many people raving about it. Yeah. There's a very young actress in it that she was the co-lead in Bottoms, and I know about her. Yeah, 
just I cannot praise that movie enough for just mm-hmm. how hilarious it is. Like mm-hmm. it's like they figured out a way to do stupid comedy without being stupid. Okay. It just works. I like that. I like that review, like the tiny, tiny snippet. Figure out how to do a stupid comedy without being stupid. That's I think that's a very well said. Yeah, like yeah, you see Naked Gun. They like that is a great stupid comedy. Yes, or Airplane. Yeah, and like when you say stupid comedy, that's the stuff you comes to mind. And Bottoms does that stupid comedy, but not in that. Like it just for some reason, all like everything it does is just landing in such a way that it's not stupid. It's not just a random joke to be funny. Like everything is kind of like purposefully crafted, mm-hmm. and I really appreciate it. And like, if you go and just watching it, you're. I think you should be blown away by it. Mm-hmm. So, no, I like you're not the first one who is raving about bottoms. So it's definitely on yet again on my. If you if you think my TV queue is long, my movie queue is just you know five times the size of that. So it's once it's streaming someplace, I'm definitely watching that. So, but see that. That's the weird thing. For me, when something hits streaming, I'm less likely to watch it. Really? Like, the thing that is making me watch movies, if I somehow find the time to go to the theater. Mm -hmm. But yeah, if I buy a movie, like, day one on digital, I'll end up watching it that week. Mm -hmm. It gets expensive. Like, yeah, I have HBO Max. I could probably wait a month to watch Aquaman 2, but I'll never get around to it once it's on streaming. So I literally paid 25 bucks to watch the movie today to be able to bitch about it while tweeting. I guess. And yeah. It's... So there's like a few tweets I did about it ran about like five bucks a pop. <laughs> I wish I could say money well spent, but I can, I don't want to lie to you. Yeah. Like, oh man. and I gave it a harsh review on Lenderbox. I've seen that too. I've I've seen that. Well, I've seen those tweets too. To be honest, I was like, "Well, he's definitely not enjoying that." <laughs> yeah, not so, a five out of five for sure. Definitely not. But speaking of five out of five, what's the last teen movie you would rate five out of five? Which is anything in between two thousand three to two thousand nineteen. All right, I got three movies here. Okay, let's From hear. From newest to oldest, we talked about already once, but. 2018's Game Night. Nice. I that was a movie I could just watch over and over again, never get tired of it. Mm-hmm. Before that, it was in 2017 was The Big Sick. Okay. Um, that movie was very kind of personal to me. Like I mentioned before about my daughter number four having her medical issues. While mm-hmm. at the same time she was getting revived, my wife was also going through it, and we almost lost her. Mm-hmm. And that was in 2013 that that happened. Mm. And then when I saw The Big Sick, that just like the hospital setting, all that stuff just really hit me. And mm-hmm. that movie was just very personal to me. Yeah. And now for the other movie I have on here is like, it's weird. I saw it pop up on Hulu and like, I think it's kind of become a cult classic, but uh, Grandma's Boy. That's the only one I haven't seen yet. Okay. Uh, it that came out in two thousand six, mm-hmm. and it starred Alan Covert or Cover. I'm not sure how you say it, mm-hmm. but he was pretty much a guy that pops up in like all the Adam Sandler movies. Okay. Um, he's like Adam Sandler's best friend in real life, and but yeah, Grandma's Boy. It's about a guy that you know ends up moving into his grandma's house. He works as a video game designer. Mm-hmm. It's like a 90 minute movie fo- made by Fox. It's a pretty much like it bombed at the box office. Mm-hmm. Like I saw it opening night in the box office. And then that weekend, I went back to Philly. I took all my friends to go see it. Really glad I did because it didn't play past a week. <laughs> <laughs> like, both, like both showings that I went to, I was the only one in that first one. Me and my friends were the only ones in that other one. Mm-hmm. But it's another movie that has so many like quotable like little jokes in that movie. Like if you're among friends that you know have seen the movie, you can quote all day long. And yeah, I highly recommend it. It is a strong five out of five. Don't let the bad ratings 
for you. Mm-hmm. So, well, yeah. two excellent movies and one I'm putting on my watch list. If I ever see streaming, I'll definitely click play. Thank you for that. So what's the last adult movie you would rate five out of five, which is anything from 2002 to 1975? So for this one, like how I went about finding these movies was I pretty much just pulled up my voodoo account sorted by year. Okay. Um, Adult movies out of five out of five. Like there's such a wide time span that you've given. I have four things listed, mm-hmm. which is technically six. 1997's uh, Chasing Amy by Kevin Smith. Okay. That's a movie I've always loved. Uh, I can talk about uh, so many movies in that span are great. Um, I have the entire Back to the Future trilogy in there, mm. which I feel is really one great movie, and everyone should just always watch all three back to back to back. Yes. yes. Um, 1993's Jurassic Park. Yes. And what was the starting year for this? 75. All right. And uh, I got, you know, Jaws. Oh, yeah, of like, course. And if you look at that list, you got Kevin Smith, but then you got Jaws and Jurassic Park, both by Spielberg. Back to the Future, you know, Zemeckis, Spielberg produced. And, like, you can you give that time frame, you can't. Like, I think if you tell anyone to write down five movies from that time frame, Mm-hmm. One of them is going to be connected to Spielberg, no matter what. Yeah, yeah. No, that's but, excellent. Cho- some excellent choices there. Honest, like very good. So, and what is the last old movie you would rate five of, out of five, which is anything older than nineteen seventy four? This is the problem I have. Mm-hmm. I cannot find anything before nineteen seventy five, which is Jaws. That's fine. Jaws, like now. You've already given yeah. us quite a few movies, so you know what? I'll let you <laughs> off. I'll let you off the hook for Jaws. <laughs> so that's that's perfectly fine, Frank. That's perfectly fine. What do you think? Who? What would you say is your favorite movie decade? Then I I have to say nineties. Okay. And if you really look at it, it's not even so much the nineties. Mm-hmm. It's nineteen ninety three and nineteen ninety four. Okay. Like I feel like if you just spent the rest of your life watching every movie in those two years, you're gonna just have a lot. I mean, for all I know, there was a lot of bad shit that was in there too. But mm-hmm. you know, only the good stuff floats to the top. But like in '93 and '94, you have like Jurassic Park. Yeah. You got Schindler's List, Shawshank Redemption, Last Action Hero. Yeah, Last Action Hero, Robin Hood, Men in Tights, Falling Down. Have you, you know that one? Yes. I love that movie. That's like a live action. Like that's like if Grand Theft Auto was made into a movie with no carjackings. Mm-hmm. That's just a movie of an entire guy going through a day, gradually upgrading weapons. Yes. Um, yeah, Free Willy, Mrs. Doubtfire, Grumpy Old Man, Clerks, Rudy, Cop and a Half, which I personally believe is a classy man's kindergarten cop, if I'm being honest. Mm-hmm. All in '93 and '94. Mm-hmm. Like so many more movies you can pull just from those two years, and just because of that, like even like with the, the spectacle of like all the Marvel movies and like the like after the two thousand like, in the aughts, yeah, like even with like you know Iron Man and the Dark Knight coming out the same year, nothing can really touch ninety three and ninety four back to back. No, that's a nineties is a solid pick every single time. So yeah, no, no, no notes. Out of them, yeah, and like I just feel like you know, in 90, like, uh, I want to say I might have skipped over Terminator 2, I'm not sure, quite sure if that's three or four. I think, isn't it? Terminator 2 is in 91, I believe, yeah, like because like that was like kind of like help kickstarting CGI in movies. Mm-hmm. So then you have the 90s where they're exploring all this kind of new technology, and then like in 99, you have Phantom Menace, which is a movie that happened, yes. but. Had it not been for that and George Lucas's and Lucasfilm diving into technology that they developed all throughout this decade, we wouldn't have some of the great movies later. Mm-hmm. My hot take that I probably could have said earlier that's movie related. Oh, wait, Tell we me. do have that coming up. Never no, mind. That's a great segue. No, that's a great segue. But Tell me. Tell me. Uh, my favorite Star Wars movie is probably The Last Jedi. 
Oh, nice, nice. Like, I don't Definitely know not a hot take. Many. Definitely not but, a hot take on this podcast, but on you. <laughs> but that is the only, like, especially of the sequel trilogy, that is the only good one. Okay. Now, people, when it came out, they hated all the turns it took that people weren't expecting. Yeah. And we got that Rise of Skywalker that then tried to undo everything. Yes. So I feel like if it leaned into it the way it started, it would have made everyone retroactively then like. But I guess because of how well received Force Awakens was, even though it's just a complete remake of the original Star Wars and didn't actually bring anything new to the series, mm-hmm. people loved it because it was just more of the same flavor that they liked before. Yeah. And Rain Johnson, he at least tried to do something different, which I felt was the actual smart move that the franchise needed. Mm-hmm. And if they just did Duel of Fates like they planned, it would have just been an amazing series. But yeah, we, we got all that because the 90s started to fiddle with computers. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. No, it's I didn't even write that down. As I didn't I... even write that down. That's my hot take. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's great. No, honestly, that's great. I understand why it's a hot take. Like, I'm not disproving that, but it's definitely not a hot take on this podcast. I wouldn't maybe say the best Star Wars movie, but it's definitely, like, I appreciate it. And I had a discussion with Heath from Sif Pop also about Last Jedi and how it's such a great movie. And now people are finally realizing it, especially after Rise of Skywalker did what it did. So... Like- just... Like I got three copies of it sitting on the shelf. Wow, three copies. I got my four I got my four K Blu-ray. Mm-hmm. I got the four K box set that had it in. Um I also got an import three D Blu-ray because I do, I still have a three D TV. Wow. And I was on a stretch because like three D died out pretty quick here. So mm-hmm. at one point Disney was only releasing its three D Blu-rays internationally. Mm-hmm. So, which is another topic that I'm kind of going off on a rant here. Go for but, it. But <laughs> elsewhere in the world, 3D technology fared a lot better than it did here in the States. Mm-hmm. And Disney, being greedy, realized that they stopped selling 3D in the States. Mm-hmm. But they still sold it internationally on region-free Blu-rays. So they were getting shipped to the States a lot. And so Disney finally realized that and they cut that off and then region locked Blu-rays. I think after Black, no, after Infinity War, they region locked the 3D Blu-rays they did internationally mm. because now they want you to pay a lot more money to buy it in 3D on Apple Vision or whatever that headset's called. Oh, I see. Oh yeah, like in the the VR world, like Disney has no problem selling 3D movies, but they put the cut us off on our 3D Blu-rays a few years ago. Mm -hmm. Anyway, the actual movie hot take I wrote down is that the movie Citizen Kane can go suck a dick. (laughs) I I hate that movie. Such an overrated piece of shit. Okay. Tell me why. (laughs) It's just boring. It's dumb. Maybe the Animaniacs ruined the plot twist for me. But... From a technical standpoint, there are a lot of amazing, great shots. There's a lot of good things that Orson Welles did, especially with the finding a way to frame everything in the frame mm-hmm. in focus. Mm-hmm. I'll give him that, but that movie is such a time waste. Like, <laughs> I don't give a shit about an old guy dying in a mansion. Mm-hmm. I don't care how big his fireplace is. <laughs> I do care that my cat's about to knock over a statue. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, um, yeah, I hate Citizen Kane. Mm-hmm. I don't know why it's on the top of so many lists. Well, so I, many I do. No, I do understand. Look, look, I do understand your point, but I also understand why it's so beloved because it did so many things first. And yeah, being the first, you know, usually helps with being like you know culturally relative, you know, or relevant. I mean, you know. And appreciate it and all that stuff. Even though it didn't win the Oscars that year. Many many people point to that as well. How underappreciated it was even when it was released. Because... I mean, you could be the first one to fuck a woman. <laughs> doesn't mean you're going to be the greatest fuck she ever had. That's true. 
like you may have some good techniques, but there are going to be plenty of other people after you with the same techniques mm -hmm. that are improving upon whatever you invented. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's a little bit of, uh, you know, the last Jedi in me where it's like, you know, sometimes you just got to let the past burn. Okay. Like, yeah, he did technical stuff. That was great. We have since built on it and we can kind of kick it down the list. We mm -hmm. can, we can give it an honorable mention saying, hey, thank you for the techniques that you did. Thank you for what you taught us, but uh, we got it from here. All right. Well, that's, that's definitely not something, not an opinion I would share, but I do appreciate you <laughs> bring, it, bring it forward. Like, you know, this is the thing. We don't have to agree. Like, and this is the perfect, yeah. this is the great thing about this. So I, like, you know, I actually... know, like, this is, oh, I'm not, I don't mean to attack you. No, 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 no. When I say what I'm about to say. Tell me. But I do feel like, a lot of online, uh, pretty much what you would call film Twitter. Okay, yeah. A whole bunch of bullshit that I say, oh, this is the greatest movie ever. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, they're only saying that because they want to appear to be, you know, prestigious in a way. Yeah, or yeah. Whatever. And I am so, I have so much of a disconnect with that movie where I feel like, do you actually believe that or do you mm -hmm. feel like you have to say that? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, it's like, look, this is why I, this is why I actually wanted to talk to people behind, you know, those reviews and behind, you know, you would, you would hear many people talking about movies, but you wouldn't know what those people are actually about. So to me, this is the point of this podcast where I will bring you on and you tell me something like this. And even though I don't necessarily agree with you, I'll listen to you and I'll take all your points. And I'll be like, all right, I see where he's coming from. That doesn't mean I'll agree that I, but you know, we can agree to disagree. And this is the thing. I feel like people have kind of stopped doing that or have like learned or, or unlearned how to do that, like how to politely yeah, like, agree to disagree with, you know, especially yeah, like about movies. Yeah. It's mind boggling. Like, this is why, like, the way I feel about film criticism, and I'm not bashing on Rotten Tomatoes. Mm -hmm. Like, I know people need to know how to, like, read the score. Like, that yes. percentage isn't like, hey, it scored 90 on the test. It did a good job. Mm -hmm. No, that means 90% of the critics found the movie more likable than unlikable. Yes. That's all that means. And I've always felt that people need to not rely or in Rotten Tomatoes in that way, but mm -hmm. what people need to do is, all right, I'm giving away a billion dollar idea of what I want Rotten Tomatoes to implement <laughs> that I want to sell them as an idea, all in right. which people, like all your verified critics or certified critics, mm -hmm. they need to have a list of movies that they have to review. Okay. And then when you sign up on Rotten Tomatoes as a user, you then rate all those same movies. Mm-hmm. And then their computers should line you up with the critic that is closest to what you just rated those same movies. Okay. That way then you now have a critic to follow in which whatever they feel about a movie, you know, is more likely to be in line with how you feel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then like, as they rate movies, maybe you should rate movies. And then the algorithm can figure out like, Okay, well, you're trying to figure out what Hangover Part 5, if that's going to be your kind of movie. We're going to mm -hmm. look at all the results of all the critics that have rated comedies over the years. Yeah. And then figure out the score among them on mm -hmm. what they think about Hangover Part 5 would be to you, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. No, it does. And then I feel like the first, like, if Ron Tomatoes could implement that, they would absolutely dominate the review space in which like because then it's just a personalized score based off of similar minded critics to your own mm -hmm. but then in a way like because i always feel like you need to find a critic that is more in line with you mm -hmm. and that's who you need to focus on like my reviews are very sporadic to where like i'm pretty sure I am the only person in the world with my taste in movies. Because, mm -hmm. like, I could absolutely love, like, Bottoms. Like, that movie has a lot of kind of off the wall comedy, and I just loved Scary Movie 17. I'm probably not going to like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
And again, like you are the only you, isn't it? And that's the thing. And yeah. I'm I strongly believe in no matter what critics say, I strongly believe in at the end of the day, you need to watch it for yourself. It doesn't matter yeah. if you know if movie is rated on Rotten Tomatoes is like 90% or 10%. You know, at the end of the day, I would like to see it for myself before I form, you know, before I form any opinion on it. So like my takes on Aquaman 2 today have been harsh. Yes. Where like I literally called that movie a piece of shit. Mm-hmm. I rarely do that because I I just think any movie you ever seen, mm-hmm. no matter how good it is, no matter how bad it is, there is someone in the world who that is their favorite movie. Yes. So I try not to call a movie shit until I know for sure there there is going to be zero people that be like Aquaman <laughs> two. That is my favorite movie of all. Like no way am I going to offend anybody by calling that movie a piece of shit. <laughs> I guarantee you there is like an eight year old who's seen it in a cinema and it's like, oh, this is most the coolest movie ever. Like I can't Yeah, be... but that's because they're very old and they're on the good medication. Mm-hmm. Like I'm sure if I was dropping acid and was watching that movie in 3D, I probably would have fucking loved Aquaman too. Mm-hmm. It has colors, it has shapes, people's faces are all wavy. It's moving. But, yeah, like <sighs> And it's weird, like, I looked at my reviews, I gave that movie, like, a full star and a half, maybe? Okay. Maybe two stars, even. And the first one, I only gave a half a star. So if you look at I love this movie in comparison to that first one. But they're both shitty. And yeah. like No, but again, exactly what you said. Like, you know, like, I don't have to like a movie, but for somebody else, there, is, there might be that, you know, uh, favorite, most, like, favorite movie of all time. Like perfect example, my favorite movie of all time, and my my best friend, he hates that movie. You know, he absolutely hates it, and we are still best friends because you know we can agree to disagree. We I understand uh, that he you know his movie taste is different than mine. I, I gotta mean, know. Yeah, th- this may affect my opinion because you said he hates it, and you said it's your favorite movie. What's the movie? It's Lost in Translation. I can see it like that. I have. I don't think I've actually fully seen that movie. Mm-hmm. It's not one for me, I believe. But mm-hmm. yeah, that's a perfectly fine movie for anyone to love. And it's your favorite movie. I look, it's a vibe movie. It's a vibe. Like you know, you either are on it or you're not, and it's perfectly fine. And this is what I'm what I'm saying. Like you know, kind of like the movie Her. Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Similar. Yeah. Like, I'm down for it. Mm-hmm. And again, like, you know, and this is why I created this, because, you know, the purpose of this podcast is not for us to always agree to, you know, to agree. Like, you know, people will never agree. So many times, but more often than not, you agree to disagree. And it's perfectly fine. It doesn't mean I'm correct and you're not, or you're correct and I'm not. That just means I have a different taste. You have a different taste. You know, it's as simple as that. So I just find I love talking to, mo- talking to people about movies that are different than you know they have different tastes than I am, so, right. so like you have... tell me. Oh, now you're saying. Now I was gonna say like your rotten tomato idea, like you know the you would have the like you know you would get matched with the critic that matches your taste. I liked, and until I start to think about it more carefully, and I'm like, yeah, but in today's world of algorithm, that would that mean that you would just dig yourself into like even deeper echo chamber? Where you would only see the reviews you would like, and therefore you would always think, "Oh, these movies are the absolute best," and yeah. not being exposed. Because I I like to follow even on Letterbox, I like to follow many different people who, you know, don't necessarily agree with the consensus, and I'm like to like to know their opinion on. Oh, they rated this one one like you like Citizen Kane. You know, they rated <laughs> Citizen Kane like you know half a star on Letterbox. Oh, I would love to know why. Hmm. You know, but so. I kind of have a movie recommendation for you. Mm-hmm. I think you're going to like this movie because of lo- you like Lost in Translation. Okay. You know, I haven't fully seen that movie. Um, whenever I think Lost in Translation, for some reason, my mind always thinks of the movie Shop Girl with Steve Martin, Claire Danes, and Jason Schwartzman. Okay. I don't think I've seen that. You have seen it? No, I don't think I have, no. Um, Shop Girl. Yeah, it was actually a adaptation of a book that Steve Martin wrote. Mm. Uh, it's about a complex... I'm just reading off IMDb at this point. It's a complex love triangle between a bored sales girl, 
a wealthy businessman and an aimless young man. Sounds pretty generic on paper, but I I recommend it. I remember really liking it when it came out. Okay. And I for some reason when I like I said, whenever I talk about Lost in Translation, for some reason this movie just jumps up in my mind. No, that's fair. That's fair. okay. If I ever see it, I'll, again, it goes on my ever-growing watch list because my goal is to watch every single movie ever made, which unrealistic, but it's my goal. You know, man has to have dreams and aspirations. Uh, so I don't watch them. <laughs> no, but yeah, like so, like I'm again, I'm not sh- shy to watch anything. Like you know, like I have, I don't have an, you know, genre doesn't matter, year doesn't matter. Just give it to me, and I'll watch it. You know, if I could, I would watch movies all the time. Nice. No, but yeah, so now I think we can move to the underrated part of this podcast. So, Frank, who would you say is the most underrated actor we have we have right now? It's weird. I'm going to say he's underrated, mm-hmm. even though he is, seems to be constantly working. Okay. And should be well known at this point, uh, Mark Duplass. Oh, nice. Like, if you watch The League, he's hilarious in it, but, like, he puts out a lot of really good movies, and him and his brother, they have a very good business strategy mm-hmm. of just making movies that involve minimum cast and minimum locations, mm-hmm. but still have names attached to them in which it's easy to just sell for a profit. Mm-hmm. Um, which I'm going to jump ahead a little bit, Okay. Because I know later we're going to talk about um, underrated movies, mm-hmm. in which one of my most underrated movies is one of these Mark Duplass movies. And it was um, came out in 2014 called The One I Love. Okay. I know here in the States it's on Netflix, but uh, it's a hard movie to recommend mm-hmm. because there's something in it that would be a huge selling point for a movie, but would totally ruin too much. Okay. It's a movie. I just, I blindly watched it and I highly recommend it. Like that's how you should watch it. The one I love though, it's about a couple that sees a marriage counselor played by, uh, why am I blanking on his name? He was in cheers. (laughs) Oh, Ted Danson. Yes. Ted Danson. Okay. Ted Danson is the managed therapist, and what he does is um, he recommends this couple to go to like a cottage or whatever mm-hmm. to just spend time together. Yeah. To kind of like reevaluate their marriage. Mm-hmm. That's all I'm gonna say about the movie. Please. Um, yeah. Sounds simple, but fun fact: the entire movie was shot in Ted Danson's house. Oh, nice. So. <laughs> Yeah, but yeah, it also stars um, Elizabeth Moss, kind of mm-hmm. before like, she was still just doing Mad Men, but before she started doing more movies. Yeah, but underrated movie with Mark Duplass. I feel like he's not so much an underrated actor. I think he's a under like I feel that there's a lot bigger things he can be doing, but I know he's perfectly fine like getting money from what Apple TV doing morning show. Mm-hmm. Who he's like. It seems like he's barely in it, but yeah, he's someone who I think more people need to really focus on movies that he's done previously. Okay. Um, another couple really great movies he did, like was the same format with Creep One and Creep Two. Mm-hmm. Um, that movie, like that first one, they shot they pretty much shot both of them with like no script, mm-hmm. two actors in one location, and just spent a weekend filming. And they are two amazing movies, also, but. Again, like they don't seem to be like movies too many people talk about, and I feel like more people should. Okay. So yeah. <laughs> Yet again, it's something to add to my watch list as I've not seen either of those. So you like you need to stop recommending me movies because then like I feel like I've hey, seen I'm just nothing. recommending <laughs> at this point, I'm just gonna say Mark Duplass, open up his IMDB and just go through everything. Yes. Sounds like, like, sounds like a plan. more people need to focus on his career. Um, mm-hmm. During COVID, he shot another movie. Um, he in it, his lover pay, prepaid for like a hundred Spanish lessons over Zoom. Ooh. 
and the entire movie is pretty much just that. Okay. And he starts to develop a relationship with the woman that is teaching him Spanish. Mm-hmm. And I can't think of her name. She was also the director of it, but yeah, the entire movie is just these Zoom calls. And yeah. It was- but yeah, like I said, Mark Duplass, load up his IMDb. You really can't go wrong. I will. I will do that. So we heard your movie. And what about some underrated actresses or actress? I am going to mess up her name. I should pay more attention when you actually said it. Um, Ayo Debris. Oh, yeah, Debris? from The Bear and from uh, Bottoms. From Bottoms. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know if she's underrated. She's probably correctly rated right now, but I'm telling you, she is going to have a huge career ahead of her. Like, she is going to blow up. Mm-hmm. Um, she, this is going to sound weird, but to me, she is my next Emma Stone. Okay. okay. Like, like when I saw Super Bad in Cedars for the first time, mm-hmm. I remember walking out of Cedar going, that redhead chick. Mm-hmm. I had to look up her name later, Emma Stone. Like, I think she is going to be huge. Yeah. And, like, if if you could gamble on an actor or an actress at, like, a casino, of like, I am putting all my money on her having a huge career ahead of her. Mm-hmm. Within the next 10 to 15 years, she is going to end up with an Oscar. Well, she seems to have a momentum because even I, I have not seen Bottoms. I have still have not seen Bear. I know exactly how she looks like. I know she's been all over, like, Twitter loves her, all over media, you know, so, and she has that momentum, so, yeah, I, I think she's on the rise, and I think you're right, 10, 15 years, she probably will be an Oscar winner. Yeah, I I even need to look up more of what she's done, but, yeah, like, she, she is on a rocket ship right now, and mm-hmm. I'm very excited for her. And she also apparently is on Letterboxd, even though I'm not quite sure if it's been confirmed that's actually her or somebody using her name. <laughs> so, because, yeah, if you go to that profile who has that has her name, it leads to a X or Twitter page that actually says it's not her. So I'm kind of confused whether somebody is just, you know, pulling a prank or whether it's actually her and she's just, you know, being funny. Don't, don't know. <laughs> so we mentioned... Oh, yeah. I... Tell me. She... She voiced April in Ninja Turtles. Another movie I have not seen from this year. I I've heard about that, and I heard it's great. Oh uh, yeah, it was fantastic. No, it's again, it's on my watch list, but it's just you know, there's and not and just even here in Europe, we also work five days a week, <laughs> so there's not enough time in the day to watch as much as much as I would love to, you know. But you obviously, as a movie fan, you know that feeling too. Oh yeah. So would the Mark Dupas would be your underrated director, or do you have a different pick for that? Underrated director again, like I don't know if I'm just picking people that I know are gonna have great careers. Um, but Zach Kreger, uh, okay. he directed Barbarian. Oh yes, yes. Mm-hmm. And like he's someone that's been on my radar forever because I was a huge Whitest Kids You Know fan. R.I.P. Trevor Moore. Mm. Uh, but yeah, Barbarian, he knocked it out of park with that movie. I'm excited to see what else he directs. Um, I would say after Barbarian, he's like right up there with Jordan Peele as a comedic person that I did not know could pull off horror in such a way that he did. Mm-hmm. And like, and if you haven't seen, have you seen Barbarian? Yes, I have. Yes, I just love that whole hey. This is a fucking rom com adventure we're about to go on. Oh, it's hilarious! It's a comedy, and then, whoop, and then, ah, oh, I just, and then somehow we are in the seventies. Yeah, yeah, oh. like, like this. I, movie. Yeah, like the worst thing that they ever did was release that trailer because, like, the day after the movie came out online, they put Fox uploaded untitled Justin Long comedy. Mm-hmm. And uh, a trailer for an Untitled Justin Long comedy, and I watched it, mm-hmm. and then it ends with you finding out it being uh, another trailer for Barbarian, and I was kind of mad because I felt like it just spoiled like what would have been huge for me in that movie, and I was already looking forward to seeing it. I just couldn't get out to see it opening day. Mm-hmm. 
Like I never even saw it till it came out on digital. But no, I've only seen it after everybody's raved about it. So I so I knew I'm, I'm you know I was going into something supposedly good. But yeah, no, I I liked Barbarian very much. See that that's the worst when like a ton of people rave about a movie and then mm. you see it like it's impossible for any movie that's been raved about to live up to those expectations mm-hmm. because then you're going in like, Oh, you're going to be amazed. But it's like part of the amazement is going in, not knowing you're going to be amazed. Mm-hmm. So like when it, like when certain movies like that come out, if I know the part of it being so amazing was not expecting it, mm-hmm. when I'll tell friends like, Hey, go see this movie. Just trust me. Yeah. Like that's the best I'll rave about them until I know they've seen it. That way, mm-hmm. the surprise isn't taken from them. Yeah, no, I I get what you mean. Like I I was I was glad to see everything era, everywhere all at once before it been you know and won oh, all the Oscars. Same. same here. Like I went in like like I went to go see it with a bunch of people, and I only remember watching the trailer when it dropped once. Mm-hmm. And I forgot everything about the movie. Mm-hmm. Then watching, I just fucking loved it. Yep. No, I've heard, I've only heard a couple of people from Sith Pop raving about it, so I was like, okay, I'll, I'll go check it out. Not expecting too much, but I was like, yeah, it'll probably be fun. And then I just absolutely adored it. So same. Like here's how great that movie is. Mm-hmm. We were watching it. I already knew my letterbox review before the movie was over. Yep. Then it got to the scene was them as rocks with googly eyes oh yeah and it's dead silence and it's just you're reading the conversation on screen Mm -hmm. that was the moment in my head where i went if this movie ended right now it would be the perfect movie ever Mm -hmm. like it could just end right here and i wouldn't be mad that it ended at them just becoming rocks yeah and then i wasn't prepared for everything that came out at like everything that happened after it but at that point, that move they could have just ended the movie right there, save a whole lot of money, and be like, "Yep, it's a great movie and uh, such a good movie." That I'm glad I saw it as early as I did mm-hmm. because if I didn't see it till now, no, nah, I probably still would have been amazed. It's it's great. Like you, you just can't be prepared for that kind of movie mm-hmm. that just subverts your expectations at every move, like. They do, they layer that movie so well with like dumb shit, like, mm-hmm. you know, Raccoon Tui. Yes. It's like, why are they even making this joke? That is dumb. And then you get to the payoff like an hour and a half later. Mm-hmm. And it's like, holy shit, that was amazing. Mm-hmm. I just, I love the movie just the way, the way it's like layered, just the way it flows with jokes, with its setups. Mm-hmm. And, I think a part of it has to do with the involvement of um, the brothers. Daniels's. The what? Daniels's. Yeah, the Daniels, but also with uh, the Russos. Oh, okay. Because that's one thing the Russos know how to do. Like when they did, like, you know, Avengers, Civil War. Mm-hmm. Uh, no, not Civil War. Um, you mean Captain America oh, Civil War? America. No, the Captain America, the second Captain America. Oh, Winter Soldier. Yeah, when they did Winter Soldier, they kind of changed everything the way the direction that Marvel was heading. Mm-hmm. But then, like, yeah, with Civil War, Endgame, Infinity War, mm-hmm. the way they layered the storyline in that was great. But I think that's coupled with their television background. Yeah. Because community and arrested development, mm-hmm. that was a whole lot of setting up jokes way early for payoffs not even that happened in that season maybe in the next season yeah and then they took that mentality and shifted it to film Mm -hmm. and they did an amazing job and like this is going to be a fun this was a fun exercise i did when it came to infinity war Mm -hmm. um no was it infinity war or was it (sighs) no no when it came to endgame Endgame, okay. an amazing movie, mm-hmm. and I re-edited the entire movie <laughs> as an exercise because, like, okay, the Russo's come from this television background. I took, oh no, my Infinity War, shit, I can't remember. 
<laughs> no, no, it wasn't Infinity War, in which I just followed the groupings okay. of the way everyone was paired and re-edited it, and it came out to like four chunks of film. Okay. Where like when you edit just the timelines together of certain characters, it's like they wrote four episodes of a television show, mm-hmm. filmed them as episodes, and then when they got in that editing room, just kept jumping back and forth between them. Mm-hmm. And that's how they got a movie. And that I feel like that's kind of how with everything everywhere all at once kind of did that with jokes. Mm-hmm. They just wrote, okay, she's gonna say Rad Tui. Then there's going to be a raccoon on a raccoon theory. Then there's going to be a raccoon on chef's head later on in the movie. Okay. So here's a setup we played here, cut the punchline, move it back here. And they just did that kind of structure that just made me love that movie. And again, I can be completely wrong on this because the Daniels did an amazing job mm-hmm. and that kind of stuff. But the Russos and the Daniels together, I think is a very winning combination. Okay. The Russos, they did an amazing job with Endgame. Mm-hmm. Like, they did an amazing job with that. Yeah. But after Endgame, they did what? Extraction? No, no, no. Oh. They did the um, um, something with Tom Holland, I want to say. It's, I want to uh, say Cherry. Yeah, yeah. They did Cherry, which is it's an Apple TV movie. I feel like that was this movie's going to be a paycheck for us. Mm-hmm. I never even finished that one. And then after Cherry, they did a Netflix one with uh, Chris Evans. Yes, yes, they did. It's yeah. Um, I I watched it and see, it's so memorable. I need to go to IMDb to actually remind myself of the title. Yeah, but like now that they don't have like Marvel movies to kind of lean into to build off of them, kind of doing you know that on their own, that movie kind of just fell flat. Mm-hmm. But the team up between Russo's producing with the Daniels directing. I can't remember if Daniels also wrote it or not. Oh, uh, I believe so. By the way, the movie is called The Gray Man by Russo. Yeah. It's not a horrible movie, but it's a completely bland, hmm. forgettable action movie. Yes. And Daniels, yeah, they did they did write and directed the everything era old ones. They did it all. But yeah. Russo's producing and guiding the Daniels was just a great combination together in which I feel like they need to keep that teamwork going mm-hmm. as the Russos have kind of yeah they need to little, get back to yeah. it they need to get yeah. back but that'll be an interesting combo I'll say you know like we have because they are not really brothers you know Daniels is but Russos are yeah. so that'll be kind of interesting combination for for sure for sure all right, and speaking of interesting combinations and underrated stuff, what's what would you say is the, the most underrated TV show? I am calling this underrated because I need more and more people to be focusing on this one show. Okay, Ted. Ah, uh, the one just came that just came out. Yes. Yeah, I need as many eyeballs on it as I can because I need it to be a hit so I can get me some season two. Mm-hmm. I watched that season three times over already. Nice. But I I just love the show mm-hmm. and people just go in on it. Like even if you didn't like the movies, just trust me, go in for it. It's a show that knows how to push boundaries and then justify it later because the movie does have the added benefit of taking place in the nineties. So Mm-hmm. What they are saying in it may be offensive now. Back then, not so much. Yep. Um, they do have a character in there that kind of represents the audience of today in a way. Mm-hmm. And yeah, the show is just hilarious. And I feel like I'm the only one talking about it. <laughs> I've heard from you and from Mike Mike Hilty that he also liked it. So. It's it's I'm I'm gonna check it out, but again, it's just you know question of when it's gonna be streaming here. Uh, oh, do you guys have Peacock over there? I think we can technically buy it. Like technically, I can buy it, but I'm hoping it will just end up on one of those like platforms I'm already subscribed to because this is the kind of deal here where HBO stuff would go on this one platform I'm already subscribed to. And obviously, Netflix is more or less universal so whatever is not like you know especially their stuff you know if it's in america it's here 
like Amazon mm. Prime, like you know, we have that's pretty much joined with something else from America as well here. So it's kind of like that. So I'm hoping, I'm hoping it will show up at some at some point because I would love to watch it. I would definitely love to watch it because yeah, like I do lo- like both of those movies and I like Seth MacFarlane and Family Guy. So apparently, Ted will be on Sky Max. Oh, nice! So hopefully soon. Yeah. Well, is Sky Max a live thing or is it a streaming? It should be. I think it's kind of both. It's kind of like it's it's live, but also it's ah. saved for you to watch. All right. So just so you know, Ted will be on Sky Max starting February 9th. Oh, very nice. Well, thank you so much for doing that research for me. I, <laughs> I do appreciate it. Well, I've yep, been asking so. you a lot of questions over these past, past almost two hours. So let's flip the tables now. Do you have any questions for me? Um, What made you decide to start this podcast? I really like talking to people and I really like talking to, again, mainly movie people, but not just about movies. I just like to, I will, I, the purpose and the goal of this podcast is to not only for me to get to know you and every other guest I, I, will, I will have on more better, but also to just, you know, kind of, you know, give you the platform to, for people to get to know you, not just hey, I write about movies and you can, you know, you can follow me on Letterboxd, so you can follow me in here. But it's more about what do you, you know, what do you actually on about? You know, what do you stand for? And because to me, I find this, find those conversations interesting because, you know, anybody can talk about movies. Like, you know, neither of us have gone to film school. I don't presume you've gone to a f- film school, right? Uh, I went to the Art Institute of Philadelphia for video production and filmmaking. Oh, nice. So you actually see, so you're more, <laughs> much more qualified. You're actually much more qualified. You are actually one of the few rare occasions where you actually qualify to talk about movies. I'm not like, I'll, you know, I'll dox myself out there. I'm not qualified. I've, you know, went to university to study IT and design. Uh, so movies well, just my hobby. I, I tried to go pro with this. Has not worked out yet. Mm-hmm. Still one day make movies. But in the meantime, I'm just writing jokes to... Mm-hmm. It's a free drink set a bar. Exactly. No, but yeah, so my ultimate goal is for not only me, but for some potential listeners I might have for them to, you know, to listen to this and say, hey, this friend guy is interesting. Let me go on Letterboxd and see his reviews and, you know, and maybe you can give him a follow or maybe, you know, like, oh, hey, he, he mentioned Delaware. Okay, next time I'm in Delaware, I'll, I'll remember him and just, you know, get, you know, watch him someplace. And I feel bad because last year, for the entire year, my goal was to give every movie five out of five. <laughs> okay. Um, and, and, I was, and I was going strong, too. And then I saw one movie that finally made me break, and it made me mad. And what was that? Um, I'm actually having to look that one up. <laughs> but yeah, like every movie, it was just, oh, man. I did wonder because I've noticed like a lot of five out of fives for you because obviously I do follow you. So I was like, damn, Frank really likes this movie and this movie. I was like, damn, surprising. Okay. Yeah. So, oh, yeah, it was Little Mermaid. Oh, okay. All right. So, yeah, here's like, I need to remember to log Letterbox, but yeah, starting at the end of 2022, five out of five, uh, Silent Night, oh no, Violent Night, Cocaine Bear. John Wick 4, Dungeons and Dragons, Tetris, Joyride, Murder Mystery 2, Renfield, Guardians of the Galaxy 3, mm-hmm. and then I got Little Mermaid. Gave that <laughs> shit a one. And then Fast X, uh, Spider-Verse 2, Meg 2, Flash, I gave a 5 out of 5. Oh. <laughs> I got, I broke on a No Hard Feelings. Okay. Then Ninja Turtle, 5 out of 5. Godzilla minus 1, 5 out of 5. And then with the Marvels, I'm back to just doing my honest reviews. I see. I see. But yeah, for that entire year, I think part of it was, um, like I said earlier, my mom died. Or my mm-hmm. mom passed away in 2022. Mm-hmm. And two days after she died, I went to the movies. Mm-hmm. Probably bad timing. Um. I went to the movie, like, 
I need a distraction. I need to get out. Like I'm knee deep in planning funeral stuff, doing everything. I want and people are like, You sure you want to go to the movies? Like, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna go. I need to escape. Yeah. And it was Black Panther too. Mm. And I am glad we got there late. When I walked in, it was just a Marvel logo. So I missed everything else in the beginning. Yep. But then every time like then they went they killed his mom. Mm-hmm. Like and I just sat through it all. Like to this day, I still don't have a rating for that movie on Letterboxd. I left it blank. Mm-hmm. I think my my official review on it was I'm not in the right space to review this movie. I'm not. Yeah. And then I just went for the next year, everything I see, I'm giving a five out of five. I'm gonna find the best in it to I see to think to push. And then I got the little mermaid and went, Nope, fuck this. I'm uh <laughs> I was gonna say this is such a like aspirational like you know like, such an inspirational quote like moment like I I could hear the fanfares like, just behind you like like you know pumping up and then and then I just got to the Little Mermaid and that shit broke me. Yeah, yeah. My review for Fast Sex I gave five out of five. I hate that movie, by the way. <laughs> okay. I only re- my review for it was just cinema. <laughs> oh, yeah, I think I remember that. I was like. Does he actually, you know, because I, I was like, is he joking? I was, I was just like so confused. Yeah, that that, that was a, definitely a year for me. Mm-hmm. Although I, hate... I did enjoy the Flash movie for what it was. I don't okay. think it was horrible. I It was a fun movie. I do stand by that review. Okay, that's all right. That's all right. And cool. um, so yeah, another question for you. Uh, okay. How are you releasing these podcasts? How? Is it? Yes. Because this is a new one, right? Yes. Have any episodes come out yet Not at this yet. point? No, yet. Now, is this just audio or video and audio? No, just audio. Okay. I probably should have asked this stuff in the beginning, but I thought it would be more hilarious to wait all this time before it be, hey, about this. So. I'll, <laughs> you know what? I'll leave this in just for you. I will say I did do a podcast before where I was completely unaware Mm-hmm. That it was going to also be video until it came out. <laughs> I see. No, this is this. To be fair, this has been a blast. Thank you so much for your time. I oh, anytime. I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. And if people appreciate it too, where would you send them if they want to follow you or read you or whatever? Uh, on Twitter at X, I am at uh, Frank Kemp three. Um, on TikTok and uh, YouTube, you can find me as uh, at Frank Kemp Comedy and Letterbox. I'm pretty sure it's just Frank Kemp's story. <laughs> I believe so. Yes, it is. <laughs> nice. So that's all. Okay, great. And you can follow me in, on Letterbox in Movies Lost or on my blog, lostinmovies.co.uk. And of course, follow, like, and subscribe to this podcast too if, you, if you're so kind and actually enjoy it. And suddenly, Lost in Translation just went full circle there for me. Hey, see, <laughs> see, I, I actually, go. I actually planned this. You know, that was a that was a kind of plan. Yeah. Uh, oh, so M Night Shyamalan there. <laughs> what a twist! <laughs> twist. But as always, this podcast is part of SPDM Crew Podcast Media. Also, big shout out to High Flyer Creative for designing my logo. To see what else they have happening, visit highflyercreative.com. And until next time, bye-bye.